Here's what's coming up on episode 128 of the Big Seance Podcast. Dina DeCastro. Those issues that have been, you know, simmering beneath the surface will rise to the surface during Venus retrograde. So it's real. Like, it's good to confront that and say, yeah, my retirement, I'm really going to have to take the reins on that and make sure I have enough. And it may take more effort, you know, than my parents had to go through, my grandparents had to go to in order to do that. And if enough of us are aware and conscious and doing our inner work, then we can turn the tide more toward the positive. But that's very hopeful, <laughs> a very hopeful perspective of me. As I've seen it to play out before, it's like the lowest common denominator does get played out on the world stage during these kinds of transits. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. Well, the last time we were all in the parlor together, Dr. Julia Mossbridge and Teresa Chung were blowing our minds with their new book, The Premonition Code, and they were very excited about their upcoming positive precog training site. Well, it just went live a few days ago, and I wanted to let you know because I just know many of you will be wanting to sign up and start training. I also know Dr. Julia is very excited about the site. So go to premonitioncode.com and click on the positive precog training link. And I'll also include this link in the show notes for this episode at bigseance.com slash 128. Well, it's time to pour the tea for Dina DeCastro. Well, today, possibly the guest who has made the most return visits to the parlor, although I haven't really counted, so Karen A. Dahlman, I don't know, she might be ahead of you, and maybe I should just let you two fight for that one, fight for the seat. But uh, once again, our favorite astrologer, Dina DeCastro, is here in the parlor. Her first appearance an interview on the show was way back in episode 53, which sounds like forever ago. She's also featured in episodes 61, 65, and back in January of this year in episode 112. So you can get to any of those episodes by visiting bigseance.com forward slash, and then just put the number of the episode, and that'll take you right to it. Just add that episode number. And I wanted to make sure you knew ahead of time before in case you're, I mean, if you're driving, don't do this, but if you're just chilling and you want to check out her website, it's dinadecastro.com. Welcome back, Dina. Thank you, Patrick. That's such a, a huge honor to be uh, returning for so many times. And I don't know if it's been uh, Karen or I who have done more, and uh, but I'm honored to even be in her company because I love her episodes as well. You guys are both fabulous. Well, can I offer you a drink on this beautiful Sunday morning? Oh, yes. I will have uh, some Earl Grey with creamer in it. I don't know that I've ever had tea with creamer in it. Well, it's not like coffee creamer, but like yeah. half and half. Yeah, but yeah. It's, a, it's a British thing and it's so good. Our uh, British listeners will be cheering you, going, yeah, she did it right. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so what are you up to lately, uh, and what instruments are you have you added to your, your study? <laughs> <laughs> well, strangely enough, my voice. Uh, I started to take vocal lessons, uh, vocal training. Yeah, and so that is, that's been so fun. It's helping me to expand my voice and use it even uh, more, I think, efficiently, even in, you know, things like this or, you know, presentations and teaching. 
but I mainly did it for singing because I love to sing, but I've never thought I had a great voice. And what this teacher has taught me is, well, anybody can sing and you need to just learn how to use the instrument like it's an instrument. And she's giving me great tricks on how to do that. So that's been my passion lately. What's your go-to style for singing? Oh, you mean like uh, the kind of music I yeah. like? I like you know, pop and rock and, you know, kind of mellow rock. But I like those like old 70s and 60s songs. I like, you know, kind of straight ahead pop rock music. So if anybody listening has openings for like a singer in their band, they can yeah, they can contact sure. you. If you have an opening in a 70s uh, cover band, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. see about where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, you have quite a few updates for the upcoming months that you want to leave for us today. And yeah. I just told you we we could just do this, uh, you know, presentation style. And I'm excited to learn so much from you today. And at the end of the interview, or if they ever fit in with your presentation, um, I'm excited to have quite a few questions that listeners have submitted for you from the big seance parlor. So great. Even if, if, if I just decide that I am a dummy and have no questions, they've got my job taken care of for today. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I always love uh, the listener questions. So what do you have for us today? What do we need? What, what do we need to know for upcoming months? All right. Well, here's what's coming. Uh, first off Venus retrograde, and this is really where my main focus will be uh, for our talk tonight. Um, this is Venus retrograde, which happens about every year and a half, and it lasts for 40 days each time. And so people know a lot about Mercury retrograde, right? And I've probably talked about that in past episodes where, you know, Mercury retrograde happens so frequently that most people are familiar with it, even if they're not that familiar with astrology. Uh, Mercury retrogrades happen three times a year for three and a half weeks each time every three and a half months. So it's a pretty reliable kind of clock. Say, oh, Mercury retrogrades coming right around the corner at some point, right? But with Venus retrograde, since it doesn't happen as frequently, people are not as familiar with its energy, but it is regular. You know, it is this every roughly year and a half pattern. And so what it means is that technically, you know, from the Earth's perspective, Venus appears to be moving backwards uh, through the zodiac Symbolically, what it means is that the qualities of Venus, which are connectivity, which are, you know, our desire to reach out and connect with others. Uh, Venus is also about relationship and partnership, not just romantic relationship, but any close one on one relationship. Venus also rules finances. We're going to talk about that. We'll get into what does it mean as it pertains to finances when Venus is retrograde. And Venus rules also the means by which we uh, kind of calm ourselves down and soothe ourselves and find pleasure. You know, the Venus in our chart relates to all of those things. And then transiting or moving Venus in the sky tells us, well, what? how do we relate to those things right now, depending on what Venus is doing? Retrogrades are times that, you know, when the planet's appearing to move backwards, it's saying it's time to be more passive and reflective in this area rather than moving forward. It's a time to turn inward for answers rather than outward. So we do a lot of self-reflection. And so, you know, the first piece of that we could say is that it's a time to reflect on our relationships and to assess how are these relationships working? You know, how is our main partnership working? Do we need to make adjustments? Do we need to have uncomfortable conversations? You know, which we're going to see with part of the time Venus is moving through Scorpio, a time of, you know, uh, a sign of confrontation and some intensity. Venus is, you know, saying also it's time retrograde, also time to reassess our values and the things that we value most, both in relationship and then possessions wise, you know, as it relates to finances and resources. So there's a lot of, you know, time with Venus retrograde to do a kind of taking stock and in inventory of our relationships, our monetary situation, and also how are we finding comfort in our lives? How are we finding pleasure in our lives? 
you can see how those things are related, that relationships and partnerships and friendships, close friendships, and the other piece of Venus, which is money, possessions, uh, resources, are connected to how we find pleasure and how we find comfort and how we find, uh, how we calm ourselves down. You know, we do it through connecting with people that we love. And we do it also through uh, connecting with things that we love, connecting with the, the things that bring us pleasure, the simple pleasures of life. On a technical note, Venus rules two signs, Taurus and Libra. And Libra is the sign of relationship and partnership. Taurus is a sign that has to do with the earthy part of it, you know, the money, possessions, uh, resources. And so you can see where Venus has these two faces. We don't often always think of Venus as a planet related to money and resources, but it actually is. So this retrograde time, it's what is it about? You know, usually Venus, when it's retrograde, it's its natural inclination to to connect and to reach out uh, is subdued a little bit. And so we turn inward. And so, you know, Venus makes us naturally want to uh, soothe or to harmonize with other people. And it's the force that makes us want to, you know, smooth things over and, and be diplomatic normally. But when it's retrograde, Think of that aspect of Venus being taken away a little bit. So this veil is lifted. And in our relationships, we're not so naturally diplomatic. Things that have been pushed, you know, under the rug for a while will come to the surface. And this doesn't sound like great news for people sometimes when they hear this coming down the road. They're like, oh, no, all this stuff is going to go down in my relationship. Well, it depends on how you've been living in that relationship. It really depends on how, um, and I want to say again, this is not just about romantic partnership, although it is about that. But if you're single, this could also be about significant friendships in your life or significant family relationships like a close sibling, uh, that those issues that have been you know, simmering beneath the surface will rise to the surface during Venus retrograde. But look at it as an opportunity to resolve those issues and to get closure on things that have been bothering you or, you know, one or both of you in the relationship. So it really is an opportunity to do that. Now, most people don't enjoy confrontation, you know, or enjoy bringing up uncomfortable things. Right. So that's the challenge part, the retrograde. Is it like when we're in this retrograde our older sibling that likes to help us is, is just like gone, you know, like our yeah. guidance is gone during the retrograde as far as like the relationships and all of that. Yeah. I like that metaphor. That's really good. I mean, it's like um, the force that usually keeps us uh, wanting to make things peaceable and, mm -hmm. you know, don't rock the boat. You know, that part of, of Venus is diminished somewhat when Venus is retrograde. And so there's less inclination for us to uh, to be s smoothing things over. And while that can sound a little scary, it's also good news because things get flushed out into the open. You know, things get really real <laughs> in Venus retrograde and we can resolve things. There can also be a theme with Venus retrograde of old relationships coming back into our lives. So again, that's a thing where people freak out when they hear it. <laughs> it's like, I don't want my old love coming back. I don't <laughs> I don't want to see that person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, again, not always about old flames or old loves. Now, that could be good news, right, for some people, too. They might have an old flame that they want to reconnect with, and that person comes back in. But, you know, the other aspect of it, too, is that when relationships come back into our lives, it gives us a chance to clear up unfinished business. And that's relieving, you know, that can take a weight off of us that can allow for us to heal and move on, you know, whether that be in a romantic relationship or a friendship or a family relationship. I actually had this happen. I'll tell a little story here that um, so I had a brother that I was out of touch with and still am for many years. And during the Venus retrograde of 2012, he came back into my life after 
seven years of not having any contact. And it was, you know, it was an opportunity to get things straight. Like I didn't know where he was for seven years and we had the chance to talk and I got a clear picture of where he was and I made the choice actually to not have him in my life because he's not healthy. And so it was hard, you know, but I was confronted with the reality of the situation that this person that I loved and cared about is in a place where I can't connect with him on a healthy level. And so I was able to put closure on that where for seven years before that I had been constantly wondering and thinking about him and agonizing over it. And then in that conversation with him I had during that Venus retrograde, I, I got to be able to put it to bed. It doesn't mean I don't still have sadness about it, but it's in a different place. It's not at the forefront, you know, for me of, of like torturing me so much. So it doesn't mean with Venus retrograde that all the relationships that come back in are going to be old love relationships. It can really be those old significant family uh, relationships or friendships that are up for revision. So, yeah, I mean, that Venus retrograde theme of things returning from the past is is super present and important as well. So let's talk a little bit about the signs that Venus is in this time. It's going to be going through Libra and Scorpio. Uh, Those are the two signs that it will be in throughout the retrograde period. And again, the retrograde dates, uh, I want to be sure to mention, are October 5th through November 16th. And I'm not sure I mentioned that at the beginning, but I'll mention it again at the end too to remind people. So when Venus is retrograde, it spends a longer than normal period in the sign or signs that it's traveling through. And so it's spending extra time in Libra and Venus. Usually it takes about three to four weeks to move through a sign, but now it's spending almost two months in each of those signs total. And so Libra and and Scorpio happen to be to relationship-oriented signs, okay? So I feel that this coming retrograde will be more focused on partnerships and even more intimate relationships and sexuality and intimacy than it normally would because of its traveling through Venus and Scorpio. So Libra has more to do with the ritualized aspects of partnership, you know, the agreements we make in order to work in harmony with another person. Um, Libra is oriented toward connection. And Scorpio is a sign that has to do with intimacy and sexuality. So it's that deeper connection and relationship. So while Venus is retrograde in Libra, it asks us to look at the balance of uh, give and take in our relationships. It asks us to say what's fair and what's not fair here. Okay, That can bring up an uncomfortable (laughs) set of questions for some of us. Again, not just your primary partnership, but look at your friendships. You know, where are you either feeling that you're leaning too much on someone else or they are leaning too much on you? And it's a good time during the Venus retrograde to readjust the balance to say, okay, let's make this more fair. Let's divide um, the balance of power more equally here. And what do we need to do in order to do that? So that theme of difficult conversations comes up, right? Especially if you have to tell somebody, I don't feel this is fair, you know, Mm -hmm. the way that it's set up here. I'm giving more in this or even for somebody to have to honestly admit to themselves, hmm, I've been leaning on this person too much. I might need to be more self-sufficient here. You know, that can be an even more challenging uh, place to get to. Right. But huge growth can come out of that for the relationship and for yourself. I might have a conversation with a few students about this <laughs> really? at school. So have you heard about this Venus retrograde? Because I think <laughs> you need to start advocating for yourself a little bit. <laughs> ah, uh-huh. So there is a little bit of leaning on you going on, right? Or other students, you know, it's like, uh, you know, Billy Bob is not going to always be with you the rest of your life to mm-hmm. answer for you or solve your yeah. problems or you know, come hug you when you're having some drama. <laughs> He's not always yeah. going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. That's such a good insight. It's like, it's really easier to spot those codependent patterns um, when we're in Venus and Libra uh, retrograde, I believe. 
So you can even spot it and other people would say, yes, talk about that theme of let's have the uncomfortable conversation that <laughs> what would it look like if you dealt with this by yourself, right? <laughs> like what would it look like if you actually pulled on your big boy or big girl pants and, you know, took care of this on your own? Because sometime you're going to have to. What if right? you didn't go to the guidance office for the 12th <laughs> time today and just kind yeah. of breathed yeah. and, you know, asked yourself how you can <laughs> solve this yeah. problem? <laughs> oh, this is a great way, Patrick, that you can use this knowledge to help your students. There we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. Either that or start a new podcast, Astrology for Educators. Right. <laughs> you know, not a bad idea <laughs> because it's good to know what's going on um, in the stars as it's affecting your students. Mm -hmm. You're going to see those themes play out in your yeah. students. Yeah. So, so then we have, uh, for part of the duration, Venus is in Scorpio, right? And in fact, it's turning retrograde in Scorpio. So this is where uh, we're invited to look at, you know, what are our own blocks or fears regarding intimacy, going deeper in relationship? What's holding us back from showing up as our true self in partnerships and even friendships? Um, it's time to get honest with ourselves and others. And so, again, this may rock the boat, but the reward is that we feel relieved of the burden to be something other than ourselves, right? The retrograde periods of any planet, I think, are an opportunity to get a new perspective on things regarding the nature of that planet and also to free ourselves of burdens that we've been carrying uh, around the things ruled by that planet. So both of those are very much tied to, okay, Venus retrograde and Libra, let's shift the balance of power. Let's, how do we make this more fair or how do we stop being codependent, right? And Venus and Scorpio, which is well, what, what are we afraid of uh, in terms of revealing ourselves, revealing our true selves to the other person? You know, it's time to get really honest and, and have those, uh, what I call, you know, hot conversations where not necessarily hot sexually, but hot, like, <laughs> oh, it's, you know, uh, it's heated, right? It's not just matter of fact, you know, I'm just going to state the facts here. It's, I have some emotional investment here and I need to tell uh, my partner or my friend what is really happening inside of me. And that's scary to do. But you know that on the other side of those conversations, those hot conversations that we have with our, our friends and partners, that there is, uh, there's a relief. There's the availability of more passion and deeper connection and a renewed sense of why, you know, why am I in this relationship, whether it be friendship or partnership. Now, now what happens if people fight this, you know, yeah. advice, like if people... Right hold back and don't have these conversations that are, are yeah. needed, you know, what happens then? That's a great, great question because our inclination is to do that, right? Just, I think human nature uh, across the board is that we, we avoid conflict. I think it's more of a cultural thing, you know, in mm -hmm. this country, it's, there's a politeness factor and also we like stability. We avoid uh, uncomfortable change. We avoid uncomfortable conversations and directness. So if people tend to do that, which they're likely to, then it builds and builds to a point of, uh, it gets so big that we can't not look at it. Right. So for example, you know, let's say, um, I were angry at a friend for, and I really am making something up here, but any friends that are listening, <laughs> I have like, going to make an imaginary friend here. <laughs> Let's say I have a friend who has been uh, taking advantage of me by me loaning them money, okay, which really isn't happening. But let's say that's happening. I've seen that happen mm -hmm. you know, to people. It's like uh, I keep helping this friend and they're not uh, either they're late paying me back or they really just take it for granted or I always end up paying for stuff, right? I've seen that pattern a lot mm -hmm. in people's relationships. Um, at the time of, of the Venus retrograde, let's say, I know that's bugging me more and more. I'm resenting it. I'm getting a lot of resentments building up and it's, it will interfere with the friendship. If I don't say it, it will bring it to a breaking point. Either we will have a fight that it, it just bursts out of me 
I bl- I say, you're just such a mooch, you know, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. out of nowhere. And I come out the side of my neck and the person is like, what? You know, I had no idea you felt that way. Um, the better way or the the healthier way to approach it would be to be proactive about it, to identify the pattern and to say, okay, let's, so let's sit down and have a conversation and I'm going to be real, but I don't need to name call. <laughs> you know, I don't need to yell at you. But it could, if we sit on it, it could break the friendship, you know, if it goes that way. And it doesn't need to. No, it doesn't need to. Now, on the other hand, if I say to my friend in the productive way, okay, I feel taken advantage of sometimes or I feel like I'm just giving you a lot of material support and you're not giving anything back then. And that person says, well, I don't think so. You know, then that's information for you that you have to act on. And that's also uncomfortable. It's like, well, then maybe this person isn't really my friend. Maybe they're someone who's just taking advantage of me. And, you know, if you look back in your life, I bet many of of the people listening can identify those kind of breaking points, you know, in friendships or relationships where they just realize like the jig is up, you know, this isn't, it's not healthy for me. It's not balanced and it's not healthy and I need to not have it anymore in my life. So that does happen, you know, during Venus retrograde and it's not necessarily a bad thing. What I'm advising is try to be proactive and do your part to clean up your side of the street, so to speak, and speak your truth about what's going on in the relationship for you. And once you've done that, it's then it's also half up to the other person to grow and step up to the the challenge and to be present with half of the equation, right? So these conversations you're saying they're going to happen. Yeah. It's just either go with the wanna- flow and and take care of it neatly or when it has no other option but to explode. Right. Like sometimes that may be the case that, you know, you have a, a another the other party is so stubborn or has their head somewhere stuffed somewhere so much that they can't <laughs> they can't see it at all. And then it's it's going to be at a breaking point anyway. But at least you've done what you can do to not have it be messy, you know, if you can avoid it and not to cause undue pain if you can avoid it to mm-hmm. yourself or the other person. You know, that's part of in that example. You know, I don't really want to name call my friend, but if I'm sitting on resentments and I just have an outburst one day, I'm likely to do that. You know, so that's just one way to to work with the energy is is to look at it as, okay, I could be proactive with this by doing self-reflection and by understanding what are the nature of my resentments, what are the nature of the things that don't feel right to me in this close relationship. So uh, let's let's actually talk a little bit about money because I haven't talked about it that much yet. Um, You know, money also brings up is an area where we get kind of uh, fearful right? When people start thinking about, oh, what if... Anxiety. Yeah. yeah, right. Just like with relationships. I mean, relationships and money are two things where we are very attached, you know, to either things being secure or things staying the way they are or wanting things to get better in this area, but we're really attached to it, right? And so when you talk about Venus retrograde with money, that also can bring up fears in people about, oh, is it going to go away? What's going to happen? Well, I would say it's more of a time to reassess how, what you value materially, you know, what are the things that are important to you on the material level? Is it really that, you know, you have a certain job and um, you're attached to it because it brings in a steady paycheck, but then maybe you look at it and think, is it worth all the stress I'm going through in that job? Or is it worth what I, you know, the price I have to pay? Uh, emotionally to work there, right? Venus retrograde is a classic time to be reassessing those connections, the things that we value uh, as it relates to the money that we're getting. And we can also re-strategize during Venus retrograde times how we make money. So while it is not a time to, you know, begin new financial ventures, like that's one thing I would warn against. Don't sign any contracts, don't start any big investments, uh, don't start a business under Venus retrograde that you want 
to make money with, <laughs> uh, which most people do if they're starting a business. Mm -hmm. You know, those are things not to do during Venus retrograde. But what you can do is think about the financial situation you're in to reflect and step back and say, is this really meeting my needs uh, the way it's set up, like the way that I'm working to get the money? And if I'm not making enough, you know, what is enough? What what would make me feel content and secure? A lot of people don't know the answer to that question, really. They, you know, we, and myself included sometimes, I'm like, I just want more, you know, I just mm -hmm. <laughs> more money. <laughs> more money is also, is always good, right? Um, but sometimes we need to really think about, well, what would feel realistically like a secure income for me? What would make me feel at least like I'm stable and secure and that my needs, my basic needs are met. But then beyond that, I have some ability to have pleasure and fun, which we all need. Uh, what's that number for you? That's going to vary from person to person. We all have different needs that way. Um, I remember last Venus retrograde, I got really clear on this. It's like, oh, now I don't want to say I'm never going to be a millionaire, but like, I don't necessarily need to be a millionaire, you know, in my life. Like, if I don't ever become a millionaire, I'm still going to be fine. And that the money that I have, and also a little bit more than that, and I came to a number for myself, would allow me to relax and feel secure and to enjoy life enough. And that was a relief for me. Like, mm -hmm. not all of us can be millionaires. Sorry to burst anyone's bubble on that. Like, you can, <laughs> you can continue, continue to hope for that. But not all of us are going to be, and not all of us can be. Um, kind of a little bit of reverse manifestation, uh, you know, thing I'm doing here. But you can also say, well, what number is good for me? And then it's maybe a more attainable goal, right? So it's also that idea of Venus retrograde, time to get real uh, with our relationship to money and resources and what what's truly of value to us. How can that... Uh, I've been in a lot of conversations recently with people either planning far ahead down the line to retirement mm -hmm. and kind of having a worry about that yeah. kind of thing or people very close to it and, you know, having conversations with financial advisors or whatever about, am I going to be okay? And what is it going to look like? And, and I've even felt myself go there as sure. I am, you know, 10, 15, years away from, you know, thinking about that. And I don't think yeah. I put enough thought into, have I done what I need to, to make sure that sure. I'm going to be okay. Cause you know, I, I live a very comfortable, you know, I don't feel like I'm constantly needing more and I feel very lucky and fortunate that I have all of my needs met, but I do have a little bit of anxiety about the future. <laughs> that's a, that's a really Good point. And a common struggle, I think, for for many of us of a similar age group right now, you know, for people in their 40s and 50s, um, I'm 49. And so I've also been thinking about this a lot. And it is, um, you know, <laughs> kind of we're in a unique dilemma that our parents and grandparents didn't really have to deal with as much, you know, mm -hmm. that things are not as secure as they used to be. Mm -hmm. And people aren't as able to make as much per the cost of living, you know, as it relates to the cost of living as they used to be. Uh, so it's real. Like, it's good to confront that and say, yeah, um, my retirement, I'm really going to have to take the reins on that and make sure I have enough. And it may take more effort, you know, than my parents had to go through, my grandparents had to go to in order to do that. So Venus retrograde is a good time to then think about that plan or that strategy that you have. It's a good time to be more conservative financially, for sure, you know, especially during that window, not to take any big financial risks, not to be impulsive with money, you know, not to overspend. I mean, those are things to guard against classically with Venus retrograde. But it's a good window in which to do the planning for the future to say, okay, how do I want to fix this so that I do feel more secure down the road? Again, it's that theme of confronting reality, you know, confronting the hard to confront facts about our financial situation. And, you know, it's one of those, again, the trigger topic for people. It's like, ooh, 
money brings up instant fear sometimes Mm -hmm. uh, for us. So I would say, yeah, it's a good time to meet with a strategist, a financial planner, and also to go through your own finances with a fine tooth comb and figure out, well, where are the leaks? Like, where are the things that I'm spending money on that I know that really aren't, you know, that are just leaks, (laughs) things that I waste. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, like I could say my latte habit is uh, (laughs) a little bit of a leak. (laughs) Now it's a treat. It's a way I find pleasure for sure. Yeah. Uh, It can get out of hand though. It's like, oh, five dollars for a, you know, coconut milk latte. It's like, well, that's a bit much. (laughs) If I do it a couple times a week, it gets out of hand. But even, you know, those small things can add up and, and we can start reining it in during Venus retrograde and say, okay, I, I can probably do with half of the latte intake that I'm doing. But you could also uh, look at it in a way like my gym membership the last two years <laughs> yeah. oh. was a leak. That was a straight up leak, but it's uh-huh. been taken care of now. I've patched it. <laughs> oh, good, good. You patched that leak? I did. Yeah. It's like use it or lose it, right? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Use it or lose it. Yep. It is time. (laughs) I hear you on that. Yeah. It's like we've got, again, get real with like what's actually happening here. Am I actually going? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yep. I will just mention also that right on the heels of this Venus retrograde, we have a Mercury retrograde right after it to kind of help us uh, rethink things (laughs) even more. (laughs) Uh, and so while the Venus retrograde is from October 5th through November 16th, then we have Mercury retrograde from November 16th through December, I want to say December 3rd, but I'd have to double check that. Um, and I think you can put all of this in the show notes too. I'll send you these dates. Okay, excellent. Yeah. And just to note to the timeframes of Venus and Libra uh, that I spoke of, Venus is in Scorpio currently. Uh, it's going to turn retrograde in Scorpio and then re-enters Libra on October 31st through December 3rd. And then it will be in Scorpio from December 3rd through January 7th. So those are the dates. But I, I just want to say basically between now and the end of the year, we have retrograde upon retrograde. And so I've been advising clients overall that this second half of 2018 is a time of more reflection and inward focus than outward motion. And uh, we just had the Mars retrograde, you know, which I wrote about at my site. I also have an article called A Cavalcade of Retrogrades, you know, all of the retrogrades (laughs) between uh, June and the end of 2018. So, yeah, it's just a time of um, to sit back, take stock not push forward so much. And that's how we can really use retrograde energies in general is to step back and get perspective and not push forward so hard. Give yourself a pass if you feel like you're not making as much headway on things as you had hoped. You know, this can include uh, with Venus, like relationship oriented projects or uh, maybe business partnership things that you thought, oh, this is really going to take off. We're going to do this now. And maybe it needs to be delayed for a little while until the beginning of 2019. Uh, so it's a time to step back and take stock, not to push your agenda so much forward. So I know that as people listen to this, they're probably doing what I do. And I'm I'm going through my personal files, you know, and I'm going, sure. mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm, you know, as you're talking, but what does it mean? What can we maybe see during this time period collectively for mm-hmm. for the world? Have you gone over that in your head? Yeah, the collective also experiences this. You know, we there's two ways that we experience these um, planetary motions, these transits of the planets. One is personal because Venus is transiting somewhere in your chart, right? It's moving through your houses. It's connecting with your planets in a certain way. And so there's a personal experience of of the Venus retrograde or any transit. And then there's the collective, right? So these themes will come up collectively. We will also see them on the world stage. So hard to imagine, but even less, you know, ability to be polite and, <laughs> and more inclination to be truthful, honest, direct, 
and perhaps uh, shadow side of Scorpio Venus retrograde could be getting ugly, you know, getting even uglier. Now, there's a lot of ugliness going on already. So I'm a little worried yeah, well. um, about how that's going to look in uh, in that time period. And we also have a midterm election in this mm-hmm. country during that time period. So I imagine the mood, you know, is one of fever pitch uh, on the collective. Now, the collective experience of things, you know, it, there is kind of that, you know, the crowd gone crazy feeling like we can't control what happens on the mass level, you know, when mass movements happen and with things that are collective, we don't have personal control over it. We're just sitting there watching in horror, you know, sometimes as all these things happen and often the lowest common denominator is what's expressed in those collective experiences. We only have control over how we use this energy personally. And if enough of us are aware and conscious and doing our inner work, if enough of us are attending to the things in our personal lives that are indicated by this pattern, then we can turn the tide more toward the positive. But that's very hopeful, (laughs) a very hopeful perspective of me. Um, As I've seen it to play out before, it's like the lowest common denominator does get played out on the world stage during these kinds of transits. Well, I think a lot of us are hopeful, you know, especially as we look at uh, midterm elections and not to try yeah. to, not to try to get political, but you know, for, it's for in our face. some, yeah, you know, I, I, I really hope. And I mean, I, I can just feel that something's got to happen. I guess it doesn't do necessarily too. mean good, <laughs> but something's well, got to happen. I hope it's good. Me too. And I would say things coming to a head, you can take that phrase a couple different ways, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) things, things coming to a head can be good news. It's like something finally is, is over or out in the open. Uh, It's like a fever breaking. It's, you know, oh, thank God. Okay. Just everything's fleshed out, which you could say that's kind of been the tenor of this entire presidency in a way is everything's fleshed out in the open for better or worse. You mm-hmm. know, all the shadow stuff, all the, the good, the bad and the ugly, you know, here it is. Um, it's all been intensified. And I think that will be even more so during this time coming up October, November. I won't venture to predict precisely how that's going to play <laughs> out. I want to hold hope that it can steer more towards the positive. So, yeah. Well, and, and, and it truly is, you know, because we're sitting here talking to an international audience, too. But yeah. they, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a message from someone from Australia or the UK or my Canadian friends. And they're like, so, hey, I just turned on the news. What's going on? You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, this is, it is being played out on the whole world stage. And, right. you know, it sometimes embarrassing, but it's like. Yeah, sorry. Wish we could be better. <laughs> yeah. Well, and to be fair, like other countries are definitely yeah. experience, experiencing their, you know, shadow stuff and their difficulties coming up too. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, U- the UK has its share of it, mm-hmm. you know, as well with Brexit and all of that. So, yeah, it it's not just us, but uh, we have just a particularly loud and embarrassing expression of it at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So... Susan Davey, and I asked my question before even realizing that hers is kind of related. She says, I wonder if Dina has some thoughts on coming key astrological events and collective consciousness. You hear people talking about the quickening, she says, and I would like to think it is a thing, but don't quite Mm -hmm. get it. Yeah. Well, this, yeah, this goes, you know, to... There's some upcoming outer planetary transits in 2020 that are heavy hitters, not only in just in general, these planetary conjunctions, Jupiter to Saturn and Jupiter to Pluto and Pluto to Saturn, all of those planets lining up in Capricorn, a sign that has to do with governments and rulership and the structures of governments. So a lot of astrologers are pointing to 2020 uh, as a time of, again, like moving through the birth canal into a new something. Mm -hmm. What is that going to (laughs) be? I don't know. (laughs) 
but the breakdown of structures and the formation of new ones, you know, is definitely a theme that's very present in that year. And those planets are playing out strongly in the United States chart. At some point, we could do an entire podcast on that. Susan is from Australia, by the way. Oh, cool. Okay. I mean, I think that this is one of those, uh, definitely it's, it's a collective energy as well. You know, it's not just the United States, but the United States chart is, is very strongly impacted by those outer planet transits. Marilyn Kastner Painter, my buddy and, and very first guest on this podcast, she has a question that it's right in my alley. If the ast- astrological timing is essential to when souls enter into our world, then you would think the soul's exit from this world would also be astrologically influenced, uh, like balance of opposites. So mm-hmm. can we predict the month or the astrological sign of our exit or our death based on the astrological sign of our birth? For instance, do most Capricorns cross over or die in the month of January, for example, or another particular month? Has there been any research on this? I never thought of that ever. That's a great question. To my knowledge, there hasn't been either enough research on that or any research on the numbers as far as that specific question she asked about, okay, do Capricorns pass away more in January or such? My instinct is to say I don't think there's a correlation there because I don't, I have not seen that you can predict the timing of someone's death uh, through astrology. Now you can look back at when someone died and see things in the chart that correlate to that symbolism. But I could not look at those same things ahead of time and say, oh, this person's going to die. Nor would I want to, <laughs> nor would I want to. <laughs> I I had um, had a story of someone who went to get a reading. And so this was a, a person who was close to me who had cancer and they went to get a reading from an astrologer and that astrologer, whose name I will never mention, um, <laughs> said, oh, well, you're going to die at, you know, this time, this date in next year, right? She was wrong. Um, and also, it's not a great thing to do. I mean, it's a horrible thing to do to to try to tell somebody when they're going to die because it's not useful information. And I don't believe that anybody can really do it. Uh, but and that's a little aside from the question that your friend asked, that really what she's asking is, you know, have have we seen correlations here? And I have not seen that research. It would be interesting to see if, well, are there any patterns? But my instinct is to say, yeah, at least I haven't seen them. Talk about awkward retrograde conversations. <laughs> yeah, that probably happened during a, either a Mercury or Venus retrograde. So. Gosh, Suzanne Blackwood Rowe uh, says, does having a scheduled birth, for example, a cesarean or induction, have any bearing on your natal chart? I get asked this a lot. And uh, so, yeah, people do wonder about that. And the answer is no. Um, So when you're born is when you're born. It doesn't matter if it was cesarean or natural birth or anything. You know, it's when you're born, when you're when you took that first breath, when your body hits the light, that's when the natal chart happens. And so, yeah, it has no bearing on it. Hmm. Let's see. She also asks, she asked like six questions. <laughs> she says, poor Pluto, does it even influence us? And if so, how? I think Pluto's very powerful. Uh, I think what she's referring to is the fact that it got downgraded to a dwarf planet, which I love the name, just really uh-huh. funny. Sounds well, very Disney. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the seven dwarfs. Um, yes. I mean, short answer is Pluto still has the same effect as I have seen it, you know, in the birth chart and in transiting to our birth charts. Uh, it's immensely powerful as a, as a force. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to me that when that happened and it got downgraded, a lot of people started to question, Oh no, you know, does it even work in astrology anymore? Well, it really was just an arbitrary designation, you know, that the astronomers, uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, downgraded it. It was yeah. it was arbitrary. So it's it's a force. It's a planetary body. And they've reversed has, their decision a couple times too, right? Yeah, they have. They're just people. You know, they're just people. <laughs> they're just people. So it it really doesn't matter to me what we call it. What I know is that I've I've experienced Pluto transits in my life, and I've seen it at work in the lives of other people. And there's definitely an effect. No, I don't even understand this one. She asks the twelfth house. And in parentheses, she says, of doom and reckoning. <laughs> How can we view this constructively? I'm anxious ah. to know what this is about. Well, this is a question, especially for me, because I have, uh, in my birth chart, I have the moon and Saturn conjunct in the 12th house. You know, astrologer people or, you know, astrology uh, aficionados out there will know what that means. But um, I, so I have natally you know, placed planets in the 12th. The 12th house is traditionally called the house of troubles. The house, (laughs) also the house of self undoing, the house of hidden enemies. You know, those are the negative names for the 12th house. And so there's no getting away from the fact that there is uh, a a lot of negative connotations to the 12th house, but it is also the house of spiritual connection it's the house where we transcend ego and connect with something greater than ourselves. It's the house of, I would call it the house of the paranormal mm. or mediumship. You know, it's our ability to connect with the other side or what's with beyond what's beyond the veil. And so, uh, you know, mystics or people who are open to things that other people can't necessarily see or what's beyond the five senses uh, they often have some 12th house energy in their chart. Um, how I've experienced it in my life is, you know, that feeling that sometimes I'm walking a little bit with one foot in this world and one foot in the other. You know, I've always believed in, for example, past lives and ghosts and spirits. And, you know, that's just always been with me, you know, from a very young age. And I think it's because of that. 12th house energy. That's why so we're been friends. Area of fascination. That's right. And I think you have some 12th, <laughs> you have some 12th house stuff in your chart too. Okay. I believe if okay. I remember correctly. Yeah. I'd have to take a second gander, but I think. Oh gosh. Now I'm going to have to go back and listen to that. Yeah. Yeah. So no house or planet in the chart is either wholly positive or wholly negative. And that's one of the big misconceptions about astrology in general that I want to dispel is that, you know, there are good and bad houses or good and bad planets or good and bad aspects. Uh, We have the power to choose how we play those out. And when we make choices in alignment with our, uh, our life purpose and what we're here to do, we can transcend a lot of the negative and maybe, you know, that may be inherent in some of those place placements. So, yeah, to answer her question, the twelfth house is just as much the house of mystical connection, you know, as it is the house of troubles. Suzanne, I would be very curious to hear from you about, you know, where this question came from and and kind of, you know, how it might relate to your to your life and and what you think about Dina's answer. So either yeah. in the in the parlor, I'd love to hear a see a comment or even email me about that. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I would love to hear more about that too. And perhaps I can speak a little more individually, you yeah. know, to where she got that question in the parlor. I'll check in there. Well, Dina, I I love 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 having you come to visit us and telling oh. us what's what's in store astrologically for all of us. You know, leave us with with any final thoughts that you might have today, and and send us away. And uh, that sounded weird. And, <laughs> and and you know, let us know where we can find you. And of course, anybody can, um, you know, contact you for more of a full reading to figure out how these retrogrades specifically, you know, might affect them in their world. So let us know how people can yeah. get in touch with you. Yeah. And that's a really good point to leave on is that these retrogrades, uh, you know, Venus and Mercury will be happening in specific areas of your chart. It, they will affect people differently, you know, depending on 
where they are in the chart and what planets they are affecting or if they're not affecting any, you know, may be more pronounced, for example, for people with uh, planets in late Libra to early to mid Scorpio. And that will be you know, where Venus is traveling when it does its retrograde. So uh, if you happen to know that about your chart, it might be time to, to reach out for a reading. And you can find me at my website, dinadecastro.com. I have uh, writings there on my blog. I also have, uh, if you subscribe to my mailing list, I have a new uh, free gift for you that is called Your Past Life and Karmic Patterns and Your Life Purpose. And in that, you can find out about your uh, your nodes, the placement of them, and how that relates to your karmic patterns and your current life purpose. And then uh, you can also find me on Facebook now, excitingly. Um, I'll be in the parlor. Yay, and, she's in there already. Yay. And so I have uh, both a personal Facebook, which is Astrology Dina, and then my, uh, my business page, which is DeCastro Astrology um, in Facebook. So those are the two best places to find me now. And I'm really new on Facebook again after having been off for nine years. So I'd love it if people want to go there and like that page because I just am trying to get back into it. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to have some conversation and some participation there. Excellent. Do you have like a, a, a sign off? Do you have like a nerdy, <laughs> like astrologically yours or or <laughs> or like something like that that you use as your... Sign. Uh, <laughs> we need we really need good. something for you at the end of these episodes. Oh, your guide to the stars, or something like there that. We, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, that sounds Paul. very uh, Casey Kasem. Like guide to the stars. Yes, yeah, I I have no idea, Patrick, but I'm gonna have to think about that. This one is your homework you. now. You've got to find <laughs> some kind of send off. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no pressure, right? Yeah. Well, you <laughs> rock, Dina. Thank you again. We'll see you next time. You rock too, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you to the following Super Paranerds who support the show at patreon.com slash big seance. Genesis. Bianca Roth, Diana Lloyd, Natalie, Amy Park Gedicke, Sonia B, Jenny Becker, Kim Robb, Jim Budd, David Rubenstein, Josiel Lorenzo, Susan Davey, and Paula Mitchell. My supporters at the parlor guest level, who can be found at bigseance.com slash parlor guests, are Dina DeCastro of Dina DeCastro Astrology, Margaret Hagen, Sharon Bowles, Marion Hover, Clairvoyant, Bruce Williams, Christopher Kohler, Lena and John of Carbon Lilies, Denise Sia, Anna Frias, Norman and Linda Keller, and Karen Prime. And we can't forget... Jeffrey Peck supports at the $20 level. Thank you, Jeffrey. Well, Paranerds, my release schedule has been a little bit off lately, and it's been a wild school year, so I don't know who we're talking to next or when it'll be, but I'll be here. Have a great week. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit bigseance.com. You can find and subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and just about anywhere podcasts are found. Do you have any comments or feedback? Go to bigseance.com slash feedback to learn how to get your voice in a future show. Or you can call my feedback line, 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775-583-5563. Interested in learning how to promote and share the podcast? Go to bigseance.com slash share. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out. But we'll see you and light them again next time.
if you made it this far. It might be because you're waiting to see if I remembered to add a Paranerd hashtag this week. And you're in luck. Who will be the first? So the hashtag is Venus Retrograde. So jump on Twitter, tag me, at Big Seance, and Dina, at Sirius Astrology, and that's S-I-R-I-U-S Astrology, and use the hashtag Venus Retrograde. See ya.